Welcome to the EV Ready Podcast, featuring industry leaders and their perspectives on electrification, hosted by EV Ready Energy. Hey, everybody, this is Chris Nyan. Welcome to the EV Ready Podcast. And I am grateful to host a uh, close friend, Dina Haynes, on the podcast today. Dina, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's really good to see you and happy to happy to be here and participate. It's been too long. Um, and and just for all the listeners, Dina and I uh, went on a went on a fun journey together in our careers, trying to build strategy for larger larger verticals at the previous company that we worked with. And so we always um, held in common that uh, that uh, discussion around like how do you how do you grow and scale in this industry that well the EV charging industry that's the wild wild west right now. Uh, but to pull back a little bit, Dina, I would love uh, for you to give a little bit of your background um, at JLL, JLL, JLL uh, uh, Ernst & Young, um, and how that kind of led you into the EV charging industry and what you did while you're in the industry. Yeah. So, well, I'm not out of the industry. So just to clear that up first. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've spent nearly 20 years um, in and around buildings. I worked at JLL, lend lease Ernst & Young, various capacities of roles, but doing things like construction management, sustainability, um, corporate real estate strategy, which included workplace strategy. Um, am I allowed to say the last company I was at, Chris? Yeah, yeah, you are. Okay, you're being you a little skittish, so I just want to make sure I can say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, and then, and, and bringing all of that knowledge from various roles and companies um, within the industry to charge point leading the commercial real estate strategy, really around the go-to-market strategy, trying to win new business and scale, uh, but also doing some business development and, and meeting with different uh, real estate organizations, helping them in their journey to uh, electric transportation. And so so when I was at ChargePoint with you, the vertical I was focusing on was automotive. And I have to admit, that was the easier vertical to build a strategy around. I think we always joked around, like, what does commercial real estate actually mean? People probably yeah. asked you that question a hundred times. And so like, can you, can you try and break that down? Um, sure. I think the best way to do it is focusing on two different um, paths here. So the first is on the type of activity. And so broadly speaking, commercial real estate can mean a lot of things from an activity. So it could be construction management, it could be development, it could be financing, it could be um, property management. There's a host of activities. It could be brokerage um, where you're buying and selling or leasing um, for different organizations, host of activities that fit within commercial real estate. But then you also have the different asset classes in commercial real estate. So think of office, pretty straightforward, retail, pretty straightforward, um, hospitality, generally straightforward, but then you've got industrial, which is more of the um, storage, distribution centers, manufacturing. Um, you've got multifamily residential in there. So you can think about real estate really by activity and asset class, and they can intermingle and crisscross all different kinds of ways. And, you know, if anybody knows you, they know how intelligent you are. Um, wh what part of that complex, um, you know, um, that complex business do you think needed you the most? Ooh, um, from an EV charging standpoint? Uh, I, so, so yes, but in general, I'd, I'd like to hear that too. Yeah, I think mm, I'll start with the, the EV charging standpoint. So generally speaking, I think office and retail were pretty straightforward. You, you know, especially at our last organization, pretty, pretty straightforward retail. You want to get charging that keeps people in the stores longer so that it becomes an amenity, a benefit for the retailer to drive business in, especially if they're um, subsidizing or not trying to generate revenue off of the charging sessions themselves, but really more in-store sales. And then office, certainly an amenity to bring people into the office, into the workspace. Um, pandemic, of course, changed a lot of behaviors around um, office activities and workplace um, strategy. And so 
EV charging is a little bit of that draw and benefit of amenity that, that helps bring people back to the office. Uh, shameless plug, there was, I think a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember when it was, um, when it was published, but CBRE just released a um, research piece on the interconnection of EV charging and uh, return to work behaviors. Um, I was part of the team that helped develop that while I was at ChargePoint. Uh, amazing piece of information, anyone that's focused on, on workplace. Um, and hopefully there's more more uh, research that, that comes out down the road. But I think that is a really great start. And um, I'll send it to you, Chris, in case there's a way you can share that with uh, the audience here too. What, what was the high level outcome of that report? That um, the there are a few different, um, a few different takeaways. One is that the trend and days where people come into the office have shifted pre and post pandemic, that workplace charging has also shifted pre and post pandemic, that there's a benefit to providing EV charging in the workplace and um, a correlation there. And on top of it, that charging sessions have grown significantly, even though the number of charging stations has not, which means that there is truly a demand for EV charging in the workplace. And it would behoove um, workplaces and companies to, in, or their landlords to invest in EV charging to benefit their employees and continue to drive in-person collaboration and um, work. It was interesting. So we, me and my, my family just came back from Disney World and in the flight back, completely coincidentally, the, the business school that I went to, that I went to college to, they were sitting next to us on the plane. Yeah. And obviously being like the younger generation, they were very, very pro EV. But I asked them, I was like, do you want um, like to be work completely at home? Do you want to work completely in the office or do you want some type of like hybrid experience? And and they want to go back to the office with some type of a hybrid experience. Um, so I, I can totally see in the future where, you know, obviously I believe this, but like, it's good to hear like the supporting data that, that yeah. other people wanted to. Yeah. There's tons of data research charts and, you know, quantitative information in there that I would, you know, recommend, but um, high level, that was a, a pretty brief summary of it. And, and, you know, talk to me about the, the, the CRE space. Like there are some industries that are so fragmented that it's really hard to go, um, you know, if you're a large company, it's hard to go sort of like attack it. Um, you know, in the automotive space, you have uh, a couple thousand dealer groups in the U S but, um, several really, really large ones. And then you have the auto manufacturers. So there is some type of a strategy, you know, where 80, 90% of decision makers can be, um, or, or properties, you know, it's, you know, 10% of decision makers. How does it work on the CRE side? Is it, you know, what percentage are the, are the, are the big boys and versus the smaller companies? Um, from a company standpoint, it's really, really fragmented. Um, I was trying to look up a stat, um, prepping for, for today, just so I had a few pieces of quantitative information. And if I recall correctly, I don't know what it is across the board, but um, I focused a lot on multifamily. And so um, from a residential standpoint, the largest 50 residential commercial real estate owners only account for 30 to 40% of market share. So that's less than 1% of market share each on average. Um, and then you've got the rest of the 60 to 70% of the market that is taken over by thousands, tens of thousands uh, companies that are out there. And so it's really, really fragmented um, when you're looking at a company basis. In terms of how does one of those companies, whether they're the large ones or the small ones, big fish, small fish, how do they go and attack getting EV charging in? It kind of depends. It depends on um, 
you know, their activities. So are they doing development or construction or owning or property management? It depends, but my recommendation, and this is what I would talk to our customers about is understand the landscape, take your portfolio, do an analysis, figure out where the incentives are, because that's going to reduce your um, capital uh, outlay on your first project, on many projects maybe. So understand where incentives are, understand where demand is, and at the very minimum, cross those two. And then you can at least start to figure out where you should go. And then if it's in, let's say, Los Angeles and um, Miami as examples, those are really easy examples, but let's say it's Los Angeles, Miami, and somewhere else where your portfolio is, um, but you're thinking of maybe disposing of your assets in Miami, then maybe don't go there. Think about the Los Angeles location, and then you can actually do a pilot and grow from there and get some lessons learned. Um, there are plenty of companies that go out and try to roll this out everywhere, but not before they typically do a pilot to understand how it works and all the intricacies. And I'm sure, Chris, you could probably speak to um, how you started to really understand the true end-to-end -end process of uh, deploying EV charging with your customers certainly understood it before starting your company, but now I'm sure you're like really in the weeds of it. And, you know, I'm sure you understand just how complicated things can be, all the nuances, all the, ooh, that's a surprise. And your customer's like, oh, I didn't think about that. And, and you know, understand the importance of actually piloting, testing it before doing a very, very large scale deployment. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think kind of what happened in the industry was, a lot of the, the the charging companies went public back in 2019 and uh the industry's cooled off a little bit it's just you know it's just a reality of the situation right now but i think kind of what happened is you have hardware companies you have software companies you have companies that you know just went public with really big projections that might have had higher valuations back in the day than they have today and i think like the big challenge in general across the industry right now is uh doing what's right for the end user um, you know, yeah. there's there's just a lot going on where sometimes it's difficult to always do right for the end user for companies across the board. And it's partially because gas cars were, in a way, so much more simple or 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 at least everybody understood how to use them. <laughs> Whereas mm -hmm. this has a network component, this has the um the utility component, the way that people are charged for electricity is so different than the way people were charged for gas. And I think in many, you know. In many ways, the industry is oversimplified and the end user is paying for it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, a little bit like a mic drop moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perhaps. Maybe maybe that will be the, uh, the the quote that we put at the beginning of the podcast this time. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, so talk to me about this. Like, you know, you have your bigger companies. Um, are, like in, in, in this space, where are... Um, where, where are larger companies in building an electrification strategy? And like, what would you recommend for the smaller companies that don't necessarily have a department that's focusing on it all day long? Yeah, some of the big companies don't have an electrification strategy either. So let's let's make sure that's clear. Um, <laughs> but I think they're figuring it out. And so um, I, would, I would go back to what I said before. The first place to start is a pilot. You might not get it right on that pilot, but if you're working with a really strong partner, maybe like EV Ready, um, if you're working with a really strong partner, um, I would say, you know, they can help guide you through the process. Um, they can help steer you in the right direction, especially, I mean, I was getting questions before from, from, from some large organizations and you, I was surprised that they were saying, well, what's level one? What's level three? Should we be considering those for our office property or multifamily property? And um, it's okay if, you know, for people who are listening, it's okay if you don't actually know, but it's asking the questions, working with a partner that can help guide you through that and not biting off more than you can chew. 
do a pilot. A pilot might be one location, it might be one charger, it might be a few locations, but that sort of guidance is appropriate whether it's a big fish or a small fish in terms of commercial real estate because you all have to start somewhere. And in the, the market that we're in right now, while there's a, to some extent, dry powder that's out there, the interest rates are not in a place where a lot of companies are looking to outlay capital for projects. And so they're being a little cautious in terms of where they're, you know, putting putting money out and where they're doing projects. And so the pilot will help get things going and started and will help these organizations um, if they, if it works for them, um, be an advantage. So maybe it brings tenant in tenants into your class B properties when they're looking at class A properties. Maybe it, you know, keeps a renter at your multifamily property when they're looking to move somewhere else because they have an EV. So long story short, I would say do a pilot, work with a strong partner, and then evolve and iterate on your strategy and program from there. You could roll it out nationally. Just, you know, start somewhere. Take a, take a small bite first. Yeah, 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 totally. And obviously, like you said, there's just so much funding out there that people aren't aware of. Um, it's yeah. interesting because like we're 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 focusing a lot in the battery space. And what we're finding um is that there's a lot of battery funding available as well, but sometimes mm -hmm. funding can feel complicated and intimidating, including on the charging side too. But I'm sure a lot of these entities don't realize what what's available to them and how they can use it. Yep. Absolutely. So, so, so Dina, talk a little bit about COVID. Um, I know you referenced it before, but like, uh, I remember that there's so many small things in our lives that have changed because of COVID where, you know, we just all became more effective or more efficient or, you know, the way that we lived our lives shifted in some way that was like better than it was before. Uh, obviously there's like this push right now to get back to get back to the office. I know like in the parking vertical, um, you know, a lot of these parking operators are trying to think about, Hey, how do we use our space differently? Are you seeing any of that in this industry? Um, how the pandemic has changed things? Certainly. So um, from an office standpoint, I mean, there's this almost this like, I want to call it a battle. That sounds too aggressive. But, um, you know, this this line between employees and employers in terms of coming back to the office. And yes, there's some um, people who are, you know, Gen Z who want to spend some time in the office, but not every day in the office. And then you look at millennials and maybe they might be in the same boat where they might want to spend some time in the office, or maybe they want to be fully remote. And then you look at baby boomers and they want to 100% work in the office or mostly work in the office. And so in this world where we have experienced a pandemic, We've got multiple generations working in an office who have different needs, different goals, um, different experiences and different comfort zones. It's really challenging. And then on top of that, you layer the different industries. And so tech companies are typically a little more progressive. They might also be in more progressive locations as well, broadly speaking. And then you've got financial services who, you know, aren't as progressive as tech companies. And then they have different um, models in the way that they want to work. And so you've got these multiple layers that are changing the way people, changing mm, multiple layers that um, are changing the way people use buildings and use workspaces. Um, but then they also, uh, have different behaviors and again, different needs. So it's, there's no one right answer. I gave workplace as an example, but it can really fluctuate depending on the person, the company, the location, um, and what is being experienced after COVID and, um, if that might be suitable or not for, um, for their actual needs. This isn't an EV question. This is actually just a you know a general CRE you know business model question. I guess um, I think like back in the day, probably people either owned their space or they leased their space 
but I think like there's this model that's that that is starting where there are these subscription memberships for office space. Mm -hmm. Like what is that and where is that going? Oh man. Um, so that's not an area that I've truly focused on a lot. Um, we have seen some ups and downs for sure in that, in that area. Um, some companies who've been successful, some who haven't, some who've been around for many, many years, decades before it was even like a exciting part of the real estate business. Um, I, I think there's always going to be, and I say always, and now I'm regretting that, but I think that <laughs> generally speaking, there will be a need for flexible um, workspaces or just flexible spaces in general where there's a temporary need, a short-term need. So there might be a short-term need for office space. There might be a short-term need from a residential standpoint. Um, there might be a short-term storage need in the industrial space. And so I do think that there's always going to be a short-term need, but in terms of co-working spaces and shared workspaces like that, um, I am not super knowledgeable and wouldn't want to be recorded saying my thoughts on it uh, <laughs> for it to live in perpetuity. Okay. Okay. Um, this is my last question for you is, and, and again, this isn't about one company. Um, this is about the EV charging industry. So you have hardware providers, software providers, um, maintenance providers, some combination of, of, of all of those things, people that work in energy services, um, other companies in the energy space, um, you know, obviously this is a very, uh, this is a very complex calculation, uh, when you're doing it across the portfolio, which is why I think you said, you know, test one site first, uh, what do you think, you know, if you, if you had to provide like a recommendation in general to the EV charging industry, but what, what they're doing well and what they need to change, what would that be? Ooh, for the EV charging industry as a whole, um, I think what's working, I think what is working well, so to speak, you just mentioned, which is there are different types of companies out there and there are also different types of real estate companies and business model needs. And so I don't think there's a one size fits all that will work for everyone. There's something out there for everyone. And I know that there are, um, you know, some, some beliefs that, you know, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. It has to be this way. One, I think that the industry is still too new to say that one model is truly, truly more superior than the other when, or than the others when you've got different business needs, different types of organizations, different willing willingness to invest. Um, so I actually think that is what's working well. It might be challenging for some of those companies, but I do think that from an industry as a whole, um, having the different models and different types of companies is actually working really well. And so, so probably it's, it's, and I think we agree on this. It's more about like universal standards and the ability for flexibility. Yeah. Uh, it's just really important in, in as chaotic of a moment in time. It's funny. I was, uh, I was at a conference two weeks ago and I kind of made a comment um, on, on stage and said like, this industry's chaos, the wild, wild west. And then obviously Tesla made their big announcement, I think like 48 hours later. And mm -hmm. there's nothing more chaotic than what happened there, obviously. Um, and so, so I agree with you. Like I think is, and that that's kind of definitely what, you know, we try and talk to customers about is making sure that, you know, influx of charging solutions in North America, like how does that impact you? What's the difference yeah. between the charging solutions? How can you get put in, in a difficult spot? But yeah, um, openness and flexibility is probably the the key thing for the next five years, I would say. Yeah, I do. I will say that one thing, that I also think is going really well since you mentioned Tesla, I do think that standardization to a certain extent around charging is one of the best things that, you know, has probably happened in a long time in this space because it does provide that flexibility and 
Um, it provides a, I'll say, some extent, a more consistent experience for the driver and the end user. And so when you can make it easy for them and you make it easy for uh, the site hosts, the, the you know properties, companies that actually have EV charging uh, installed, it's actually going to continue to drive more adoption of electric vehicles, which you know, really is better for the environment, better, um, you know, for people, certainly cleaner air, healthier communities, things like that. And so um, I would I would add that to something that's working really well that I, you know, was excited when the announcement, you know, was made about some of the OEMs and continue to be excited about that too. I always, uh, you know, I always throw at the statistic where I don't think people realized back in 2014 that iMessage was going to drive Apple to have 92% market share of yeah. Gen Z in the United States. And even that might potentially get broken up uh, right now. I think that's that's being discussed by the government. But, you know, obviously, anytime you don't have openness, it allows companies to not necessarily perform. And um and it probably is not, you know, the best circumstance that, you know, these compliance standards exist so that, you know, every company has to do everything they can to continue owning the market share that they have. Yep. Yep. Um, thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, really great chatting with you. Um, definitely let's, you know, maybe do this again or uh, offline, you know, continue to, to touch base too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We'll do both. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank you.